Well, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Steve Brooks, filling in for Daryl Press, who's away this week. And I'm very happy to do so, because we have a distinguished speaker here today, someone that I've read his stuff over the years. I'm very interested to hear what he has to say on the topic of terrorism and a turbulent Middle East. And I was joking uh, before that, you know, when did you choose this title, you know, turbulent Middle East, given, you know, it couldn't have been a better you know, adjective to describe than turbulent. We'd have to monitor during the actual talk to see which government is still in power. Um, but let me now very quickly introduce um, Paul. Um, this lecture um, is part of the War and Peace Studies Program series. Um, when the general series is entitled The United States in the Middle East, and it's sponsored by the Dickey Center. And we are lucky here to have a um, distinguished lecturer who has spent literally um, decades working on these issues um, at the highest levels of government. He spent 28 years in the U.S. intelligence community, in which his last position was National Intelligence Officer for the Middle East. He's also been a faculty member for the past uh, seven years at the Georgetown Security Studies Program. Um, he received his B.A. Phil from Oxford University, his Ph.D. from Princeton University. He's one of the few people I know who has kind of worked in both academia and the policy world, contributing to both. He's the author of two notable books on important topics, one entitled Negotiating Peace, War Termination as a Bargaining Process, which was published by Princeton University Press in 1983, and Terrorism and U.S. Foreign Policy, uh, which was published by Brookings in 2001. And last and most important aspect of his biography to highlight for you is that Paul was uh, received his degree from Dartmouth College in 1969. So. Let's welcome him back and look forward to your presentation today. Thank you. We have the right uh, audio. Thank you. Steve, thanks very much uh, for the very kind introduction. and. Um, I want to say what a privilege it is to uh, be here at the Dickey Center. I've had the occasion to do that once before, and I would just note uh, in terms of my uh, long distant past as an undergraduate here, which was in the late 1960s, that the namesake of this center, John Sloan Dickey, was still president of the college at that time. It was uh, among the last few years of his uh, quarter century tenure as the college president, so it's quite a privilege and pleasure to, uh, to be with you here today. Um, my uh, particular connection with uh, terrorism and counterterrorism, I should emphasize the connections with counterterrorism, not the other one, um, is, uh, consists mainly of, uh, on, the, on the government side, uh, working on that topic for most of the 1990s. I did other things in my part of the uh, the Federal Service, but uh, during that decade, all pre-9-11 uh, was involved uh, in, was working at, at the Counterterrorist Center at the CIA, was head of analysis there for a number of years, and I was deputy chief of the whole center. Um, and since then, as, as Steve mentioned, I, I wrote a book after I left that responsibility, spent a year at Brookings uh, writing the book, and I've had, and I teach uh, the subject uh, uh, at Georgetown now. Um, so that's, that's part of where I'm coming from. And when uh, Daryl Press uh, asked me to uh, come down to give this talk, uh, he made it clear this was part of the series that you have here on the United States and the Middle East. So what I intend to do is focus on questions having to do with how international terrorism relates to the broader theme of the U.S. in the Middle East. Uh, but I hasten to add, I'm fair game for anything else you would like to bring up in, in the discussion phase with regard to international terrorism generally, or um, going a bit beyond the Middle East. I'm, I'm defining the Middle East the way we define it bureaucratically in the government, which is to say it basically stops at Iran when you're going east. But if you like to talk about South Asian stuff and Afghanistan and Pakistan and so on, um, that's fair game as well. And, and Steve, just one correction. When I was the National Intelligence Officer those last several years of my federal service, my title was National Intelligence Officer for the Near East and South Asia. <laughs> 
Um, and when I left that job, they split it into two. They now have uh, a national intelligence officer for the Near East and one for South Asia. So I like to brag that they couldn't replace me with one person, uh, but had to do it too. Actually, we should have done that years ago, but uh, anyway. Why is the Middle East, as I've just defined it, so associated, so strongly associated with international terrorism? And let's face it, it is, uh, as we are reminded by and as demonstrated by such facts as the nationalities of the 9-11 hijackers, overwhelmingly Saudis plus Egyptians and Emirati and so on. And I would summarize the reasons why we have this strong association between the type of international terrorism that so bedevils and concerns us today and this particular region for several reasons. One is the history and background of the relationship between the Middle East and the Judeo-Christian West. And that is one that involves a history of colonization, of subjugation, which of course was true as well of a lot of other regions, Sub-Saharan Africa, much of the rest of Asia, Latin America, and so on. But there was a difference with the Middle East in that the Arab Middle East had a previous history, a glorious history, when it was way ahead of the West. I'm talking about when the West and Europe was mired in the dark ages, 9th century, 10th century, that's the sort of time I'm talking about. And where, if there was any place in our half of the globe where the, the light of learning from the ancients was kept alive and, and there was uh, more of advances being made in the arts and sciences and so on, it was under the Arab Caliphates. And it's against that backdrop that with the subsequent centuries history of relative decline by the Arab Middle East in particular, in comparison with everything the West did post enlightenment, that there is an extra, um, an extra set of negative sentiments that you don't find in those other areas that also had a colonial history. Uh, a set of sentiments that I think is well summarized by the title of one of Bernard Lewis's books, What Went Wrong? Meaning that was the question that so many Middle Easterners were asking themselves, particularly as they view the long, painful decline of the Ottoman Empire as it became the sick man of Europe. And was the main manifestation of the Muslim world falling farther and farther behind the Judeo-Christian West. Then you have the political and economic conditions that still prevail today. A region, the Middle East, that in comparison with other regions of the world, number one is, and we'll wait to see how this may change with the current turmoil, but at least up till now, the least democratic uh, of any of the regions of the world, certainly since the fall of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, and which is also dominated by state-centric economies uh, that have underperformed in comparison with the more free enterprise-oriented uh, economies elsewhere, both in the West and in the Far East. And all of this, I would submit, does matter with regard to setting the kinds of conditions that increase the chance for people to resort to extreme violent measures such as international terrorism. Now you often hear refutations of what I just said. Take the economic side. People say, well, it can't be poverty is uh, a problem or a root cause of terrorism because look, we've got uh, rich terrorists. You know, Bin Laden is a you know, rich guy and the, the other 9-11 terrorists were not conspicuously poor, and that's all absolutely true. But that, I think, has the problem of oversimplifying and looking at just one dimension of what economic conditions are all about. I'm really talking not so much about abject poverty or per capita GNP. I'm talking about the kind of opportunities to advance one's status, to be an entrepreneur, to use the old army slogan, to be all that you can be which are so sorely missing and are felt even by people of the relative middle class in countries like Egypt, people like Mohammed Atta, who was the straw boss of the 9-11 operation. 
And when it comes to the political conditions, the refutation you often hear is, well, some of the biggest terrorism we're worried about takes place in democracies. You know, look at 9-11, look at after all, and all the stuff going on in Western Europe. And that, that makes the mistake of failing to disentangle the origin of the terrorism and of the terrorists, on the one hand, and where it's operationally feasible to conduct their attacks and where they want to conduct their attacks in terms of who the, uh, who the targets are. I think some of the best research I've seen on this that disentangles the origin from the point of attack uh, is by Alan Kruger, uh, an economist from Princeton who more recently has been Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Economic Policy. And he did some quantitative work that looks at the countries of origin of terrorists and correlates it with things like political and civil liberties, and he found a significant negative correlation between propensity to breed terrorists and the extent of civil and political liberties. And the logic, I think, ought to be quite clear. To the extent that there are not peaceful opportunities to act out uh, whatever one wants to act out politically and to act on grievances, be they economic or anything else, then the chance is all the greater that people will resort to the violent channels. And I think that's the sort of uh, reasoning that underlies the results that, uh, that Kruger came up with. And last but not least, in terms of why the Middle East and the association with international terrorism are the conflicts in the region and between the regions, uh, shall we say, on the edges of the region. Um, conflicts about which people have some pretty darn strong feelings, and the one about which the feelings have been most extensive, that have gone on for the longest, that involve the most people who really care about it is the Arab-Israeli conflict in all of its various manifestations, especially the Palestinian uh, side of the issue, and I'll get back to that later. Next question is, in terms of the type of terrorism that bedevils and concerns us today, why Islamists, why this jihadi brand as exemplified by Al-Qaeda? And the answer to that is, basically, it's the one ideology that's left as a vehicle for political opposition of the both the moderate and the violent sort. After the other possibilities have been tried and discredited and found wanting. In the Middle East, you had Going back a few decades, the secular Arab nationalism of Gamal Abdel Nasser, which was the dominant vehicle for political change and opposition and expression in the 50s, 60s, and even a little bit past Nasser after he died in 1970. And then there was leftism in its various manifestations, communism and other forms of the political left. And we should remember that in Egypt, uh, after Nasser died of natural causes in 1970, his successor, Anwar al-Sadat, although, as we all know, when Sadat was assassinated, it was by a political Islamist, a jihadi terrorist, if you will, in 1981. The first initial uh, challenge to his rule that people were worried about uh, was from the left and from the communists in Egypt. So uh, the secular nationalists of the Nasser stripe, uh, and the various leftist ideologies have all fallen on the ash heaps of history. And now, if you are a Middle Easterner who has a gripe and you don't have a um, peaceful way to express it, then violent political Islam of the sort that we're concerned with is your channel that is left. There's a, an evolutionary history here as to how Middle Easterner, Middle Eastern jihadist got to the transnational variety of terrorism as exemplified and embodied by Al Qaeda that have concerned us over these last few years. The people we're talking about are first and foremost interested in the political order in their home countries, in the Middle East, in Egypt, in Saudi Arabia. If Osama bin Laden really had his wish for any one thing to come true, he wouldn't put it this way publicly, but I'm certain this is the case, it would be to have the House of Saud overthrown in his home country of Saudi Arabia. And likewise with Ayman al-Zawahri, who we heard from just a couple of days ago, 
trying to uh, catch up with events in Egypt. Um, if he had his druthers, it would have been that he was the one to overthrow <laughs> the Egyptian government and not the, uh, the nonviolent, non-terrorist sorts who rallied in Tahrir Square. Well, back, in, uh, back when I was working on terrorism with, uh, and counterterrorism in the government in the 1990s, that's exactly what they were trying to do, and especially in Egypt, uh, where you had an upsurge in terrorist violence by the likes of Zawahiri's own group, the Egyptian Islamic Jihad, as well as the Gamat al-Islamiya. And thanks mainly to some very strong and repressive measures by the Egyptian government, this was crushed. And by the late 1990s, uh, pretty much the situation had been, had been stabilized. We've had some other terrorist attacks in the Sinai elsewhere since then, but nothing like what we were seeing in, say, the early to mid-1990s. So what were these people to do? Well, bin Laden comes along, and his strategic stroke of genius, after seeing the lack of success in going after the near enemy, in his case, the House of Saud, in the case of the Egyptian Islamic Jihad, the House of Mubarak. His stroke of genius was, let's go after the far enemy, the United States. And by so doing, he and his followers could profit from and leverage the resonance that anti-American themes would have and they could pose as the champion of the whole Muslim community, the Ummah, in defending it against the alleged predations of the Judeo-Christian West led by the United States. So that raises the issue, why the anti-American resonance, particularly in the Middle East? And there's a lot of tendentious stuff that's been said here in the United States that, quite frankly, has been driven by policy agendas. We need to distinguish between the motives of leaders and the issues that leaders can successfully exploit to enable them to make a difference as heads of terrorist groups, as opposed to simply being irrelevant. If any of you saw what uh, Zawahiri said uh, the other day in the audio tape he released, that would seem to confirm one of the things that was uh, uh, former President Bush's interpretation of why international terrorists are coming after the United States, and that was, you recall, they hate us, they hate our values. And what Zawahiri said the other day was a lot of unkind things about democracy, which would seem to confirm that, uh, that line. Well, you know, that's true in the sense that in terms of what Ayman al-Zawahiri wants or doesn't want, I think, yeah, he probably does hate democracy. But why does he hate it? The main reason is because the more of it there is in the Middle East, the less support there will be for the groups and the methods that re are represented by the likes of him and bin Laden. The more there are the peaceful channels for acting out political grievances, the less relevant the violent course that he represents will come. And so it, it is really misleading to say, well, they're coming after us because they hate our values. Um, these, this set of issues often gets summarized as the question of, is the United States a target because of who we are or because of what we do? And you can see immediately when you ask that question how the tendentiousness of people who have policy agendas one way or another can work into that. I'm going to get back to that a little bit later, but just bear that in mind. Um, I would suggest there are several different ways in which the United States and its role in the Middle East plays into the question of international terrorism, why more, why less. The United States is the leader of the West, and thus the legatee, fairly or unfairly, of a lot of that historical baggage that I referred to earlier about the collisions between the Muslim world and the Judeo-Christian West and what went wrong and all that sort of stuff. And as punctuated by everything from the Crusades of the Middle East to uh, of the Middle Ages 
to uh, the reconquest of the Iberian Peninsula by uh, Christian monarchs in the 15th century, um, to more recent things like the setting up of the uh, basically colonies, the mandates uh, by the British and French after World War I. And the United States, of course, had absolutely nothing to do with any of those things. Uh, nonetheless, as the leader of the West, it is seen as the principal legatee of all of this. It is also the prime source of Western culture, which although admired in some ways, is resented in other ways, especially by those we would describe as Islamic fundamentalists who see it as a form of cultural imperialism or cultural pollution of their own way of life and their own sets of beliefs. Now those, those couple of things I just mentioned, I guess would come under the heading more of who we are as opposed to what we do. You know, neither one of those sorts of things, you know, the culture that we represent and that we admit or our status as the, as the most powerful part and the legatee of, of, of uh, the most powerful part of the West and the legatee of everything the West had done, we can't change any of that. But there are several other parts, I think, that also come under the heading of what we do. And this would include, number one, the United States' own actions in the Middle East especially very conspicuous salient actions like military action. It also includes the United States posture toward those conflicts in the Middle East that people care about. And related to that, it includes the United States' relationship with regimes in the Middle East about which people there also care a lot, either positively or negatively. I'll come back to those in a moment as well. But let me give you a kind of capsule summary first of the state of jihadi terrorism. I would summarize it this way, in terms, and I'm speaking mainly of, of trends that have occurred in the decade, almost a decade since 9-11. The trends have been mainly ones of decentralization and diffusion. I think those are the most appropriate nouns to use. Al-Qaeda the group led by bin Laden and Zawahiri, and I want to be very precise, when I use that term, that's how I use it, that particular group, although many others use the term more broadly. That group is almost certainly weaker than it was a decade ago for a number of reasons, partly the pressure under which it's been placed by counter-terrorist efforts led by the United States and its partners. But the larger movement going beyond Al-Qaeda Central, what I just described, is as large and in some ways as robust as ever. That means the initiative with regard to terrorist operations or attempted terrorist operations is coming from more different places. This includes not just formal affiliates of Al-Qaeda like Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, the one we've heard a lot about in recent months, the Yemeni organization that did the Christmas bombing, that did the toner cartridge thing, that had links with uh, Nidal Hassan, the Fort Hood bomber. But also those that don't have any formal association by name or, or organization with Al-Qaeda Central. And to carry the defusion and decentralization even Farther, onesies and twosies, people like Nadal Hassan down at Fort Hood, or several others right here in the United States uh, that we've seen just in the last couple of years, like Faisal Shahzad, the Times Square bomber, or Najib Ulazazi, who was arrested in connection with another plot that was aiming at transit systems in New York, or Colin LaRose, the self styled Jihad Jane. If there's any clear trend that we've seen, certainly relevant to the United States over these last couple of years, it has been a marked increase in these people, all of whom were Americans or here in the United States, inspired in various ways by the thought, ideology, and example of the likes of bin Laden and Al-Qaeda Central, but not dependent on them, not driven by them, not ordered by them, not financed by them, and with the initiative coming from the individual. Now, I used that term link a while back. I should slap myself because I think uh, 
we're probably better off if we just abolish that word as it relates to discussions about international terrorist organizations. You hear it a lot. You know, something comes up, there's an attack or an attempted attack somewhere in the West, and the next day you'll see in the newspaper, there are links between this person and the guys in the caves in South Asia. Well, you know, links run the whole gamut from um, two people passing in the night to uh, a command and control relationship. Uh, you, you know, the, uh, the sociological theory about six degrees of separation or whatever it is, you can link anybody in the world to anyone else if, if you threw about five or six people. Well, I dare say, uh, you know, pe Middle Easterners with sort of a chip on their shoulder about the United States, you could probably link them with only about two degrees of separation. But that says absolutely nothing about where the initiative is coming from in planning, directing, financing, initiating operations. And this diffusion that I describe is basically a, a matter of the planning direction and initiation coming from more places than it ever has before. That has some serious counter-terrorist implications. The most serious one right off the bat is it makes the whole task a lot harder in the sense of detecting in the first place where an operation might be initiated. There are more different places, potential places to watch. And most of them don't have names. Most of them are not on the screens of the analysts at the National Counterterrorism Center because they come onto the screens for the first time when they attempt or plan an operation. That's harder than you know, having a good old familiar group you know, like Al-Qaeda that we followed for years and years. And, you know, that presents its own challenges to follow, but at least you know what you're looking for and more or less know what you're looking at. Another set of implications is that at the strategic level, counterterrorism is less a matter of going after and crippling any one group or even any one set of groups and more a matter of undercutting this diffusion and spread to all the onesies and twosies and other, others out there by reducing the credibility of the extremist narrative that sways these people, that leads them to take up this extreme course of action. By ex the narrative I'm talking about, everything having to do with how the United States supposedly is out to kill Muslims, to plunder their territory, and to do all those other nasty things that constitute predation by the Judeo-Christian West against the Islamic world. Not true, of course, but that's the narrative, and that is the sort of thing that inspires the people we're talking about to do extreme and violent things. <coughs> Let me take a brief detour at this point just to provide a little more context with regard to my advertised topic to the non-jihadi terrorism side of the Middle East. And some of this, you have to begin with, uh, the side that's even non-Islamist, although we don't hear much about that anymore, but I would just recall for you that as the modern age of international terrorism, if you want to call it that, really got rolling about the late 1960s, the main protagonists were not Islamists at all. They were people like George Habash's Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, doing things uh, supposedly on behalf of the Palestinian cause. Habash was a Christian and a Marxist, and very much not an Islamist. Well, the fact that we don't hear so much from people like that anymore uh, has to do with what I said earlier about ideologies that have gone out of fashion and how political Islam is what we're left with. So there are other, the other strands of extremist political Islam as far as terrorism is concerned, and two groups in particular come to mind, Lebanese Hezbollah and Hamas, the Palestinian group, both of which very much Islamists, both of which have certainly used terrorism. Uh, but the one point I want to make about them is they are not jihadis. Um, they are not part of this larger orbit I've been describing, inspired by the likes of bin Laden. And their goals are far different. In the case of Hezbollah, it has to do with 
power and respect and influence, especially inside Lebanon. And Hezbollah has been, as we all know, wonderfully successful from their point of view in recent years in carving out a legitimate niche for itself that goes far beyond the terrorist methods that they've historically used. They are now accepted by most all Lebanese and most other Middle Eastern uh, political actors as a legitimate political actor in their own right. And as far as Hamas is concerned, uh, they have a very specific set of objectives as well, which has to do with political power in Palestine. And neither of those two H groups uh, has the United States in its crosshairs and has no desire or reason to attack U.S. interests unless we give them a reason. The last time we had, um, well, let me back up a bit. We, we, with Hezbollah, we gave them reasons back in the 1980s when we intervened in Lebanon. And then we all know what happened, the bombing of the Marine Barracks, which until 9-11 was the single deadliest terrorist attack as far as U.S. citizens was concerned that we've ever suffered, uh, the bombing of the U.S. Embassy, the hostage taking, and so on. We got out of Lebanon, and after the, uh, those couple of big bombings, President Reagan decided we're not going to stay here. The bombing stopped. The last uh, Lebanese Hezbollah operation, I shouldn't say, uh, the last operation in which they had a hand, played some kind of role, in which U.S. blood was shed was the Kobar Towers bombing in 1996. That's now 15 years ago. I would have no doubt, however, that if we gave them a reason again, or we gave their Iranian friend and patron, the Islamic Republic, a reason to strike back. They would, and here I'm talking about something like a military clash in the Persian Gulf. Hezbollah would strike again, and they, we must assume they have the capability to strike again, even though their arch terrorist, Imad Magniya, died in a car bombing in Syria some three years ago. And as far as Hamas is concerned, the only Americans who have died at Hamas's hands are ones who happened to be on the wrong street corner in Israel when, uh, when a bomb went off. The other thing I want to mention uh, briefly, and this is something else that might change a bit with the current events in the Middle East, um, although not a whole lot actually, is state sponsorship of terrorism. And here the, the mega trend over not just the last 10 years, but I would say over the last, say, 25 years, has been a marked reduction in state sponsorship of terrorism. By state sponsorship, I mean either a state having its own agents or operatives carry out terrorist operations or directly assisting or instigating a group to do it on its behalf. And we can just look at several of the actors in, in the Middle East and see how much this has changed. Gaddafi's Libya doing all kinds of awful stuff back in the 70s and into the 80s, including Pan Am 103 against a U.S. target, which many people died. But then he changed course. We came to terms with him. And um, now, we'll see if he stays in power or not, the most recent reports from Libya suggest that uh, his, um, his power is um, near the end. Uh, he's been a partner of ours in combating jihadi terrorism. Uh, Syria was doing an awful lot of uh, things like blowing up airplanes and trying to do that back in, uh, in the 70s and 80s, but now they, they are still on our state sponsor of terrorism list, uh, and appropriately so because they main, maintain contacts with the likes of Lebanese Hezbollah and some of the Palestinian groups. That all has to do with holding a club over the head of the Israelis as one of the weapons to try to get the Golan Heights back. And that leaves Iran, which is still appropriately considered the principal state sponsor of terrorism on, on several scores. But even with Iran, there's been a major change from, say, the 1980s and into the early 90s to what they've been doing over the last decade or so. The assassinations of dissidents in Western European countries and so on doesn't take place anymore. Um, and I could go on in other respects. But again, the overall trend is um, much less of this uh, state sponsorship. So that, let, let me get back to the jihadis then. You can't do much about the fixed sources of resentment, the fact that we're the only superpower left and so on. We can do things about what we do and not just who we are. 
I mentioned one of those what we do things is our own actions in the Middle East, especially military actions. And there is no way to avoid as the single most important thing we've done that has had deleterious effects in this regard, and that's the Iraq War. I mean, certainly the, the biggest, most conspicuous action we've taken in the Middle East in recent times, and it happened to be a pretty bloody one. Let me quote to you a judgment from a national intelligence estimate the intelligence community produced in uh, 2006. So this is after I retired. I had nothing to do with it. And this was an estimate on international terrorism, not an estimate on Iraq. But the estimators felt it necessary to make their judgment about what the effect of the Iraq war has been on international terrorism. And I quote from the unclassified judgments that were publicly released. The Iraq conflict has become the cause celeb for jihadists, breeding a deep resentment of U.S. involvement in the Muslim world and cultivating supporters for the global jihadist movement, unquote. Well, now the Iraq war is wound down, and, and uh, I trust uh, President Obama when he says that he's going to live up to his own commitment and the commitment of the agreement with the Iraqis to have us out totally by the end of this year. But I think we're going to be seeing the lingering effects for quite some time, just as we've seen the lingering effects on the jihadi movement of the tenure insurgency against the Soviets back in the 1980s in terms of people developing the skills, people getting inspired, and people networking with other jihadis from other nationalities, which we see reflected in the networks today. And note also what some of those individuals like the Americans I mentioned, Hassan and Shazad and Zazi and those people, what they say about what motivated them for what they did. And this is the one common thread that you can see with these people. In each case, they said they were angered by what the US was doing in the Muslim world, be it Iraq, be it Afghanistan, be it uh, the U.S. posture toward the Arab-Israeli conflict. It was U.S. actions and policies with regard to the Islamic world. So the biggest thing I think we can do to reduce the terrorist threat from this region to the United States is to avoid some of the mistakes that we've made in the past. And I've just mentioned a couple of those mistakes. A U.S. military presence in that part of the world is a very conspicuous thing that gets a lot of people upset, but actual activity, actual action, guns being fired, as in the Iraq war, is always going to have even more of an effect than a mere presence. The posture we take toward conflicts in the region is also important, and again, the granddaddy of those, the Arab-Israeli conflict in all its dimensions, overshadows just about everything else. Why is this so important in the eyes of so many Middle Easterners, especially Arab Muslims? Well, it goes back to some of that background that I talked about in terms of the historical baggage, the colonialization, and all that sort of thing. Israel, of course, is not a colony of anybody. And yet, a lot of Arabs see it as one, as something that was imposed by the West and a kind of Western excrescence that still is out there even after all the British and French mandates um, dissolved and we had independent countries like Iraq and Syria and Jordan come into existence. And because the Israeli-Arab conflict in all its dimensions has Arabs on one side, every Arab, to varying degrees admittedly, feels some sort of involvement some sort of stake in that conflict. They don't just see themselves as third parties. The United States has come to be seen on, in the view of Arabs, the wrong side of all of this. And there's plenty of behavior to lead people to reasonably conclude that the United States, to put it crassly and bluntly, I, I can't think of any other way to put it to make the point directly, dances to an Israeli tune. And we saw the most recent indication of this just three days ago at the UN Security Council when the Obama administration cast its first UN Security Council veto.
Many of the arguments that people make to the contrary of what I've just said um, are usually straw man arguments that basically say, well, there's going to be all, all this other reason for extremism and turmoil and distrust on the part of the rest of the Middle East. It's not just this conflict or that conflict or this issue or that issue. And of course, that's true. But you know, the fallacy in that argument is it's simply not true that if something doesn't explain everything, that it follows that it doesn't explain anything. And it indeed may explain a lot. And I think the things I've talked about do explain a lot. It's not just uh, the Israeli dimension, of course, and this is uh, the last part of what I'm going to talk about before we open it up. It's the U.S. relationship with Arab governments um, in the region. And this, of course, gets very pointedly to the dramatic events that have been unfolding over these last few weeks in the Middle East. The quandary that U.S. policymakers have faced in trying not to be on the wrong side of something with all of the extremist implications that I've suggested, as well as other implications, but also not throwing out the benefits of relationships that the United States has had for years and years, including counter-terrorist cooperation is one of the most important things to us with a number of these regimes. Uh, the quandary is not entirely new. It didn't just all start last month. Uh, one of the bits of fairly recent history that still looms large over the thinking of U.S. officials and ex-officials and Middle Eastern as, as well were the events in Algeria back around 1991-92. If any of you are familiar with that, you, re you know what I'm talking about. The, the as Islamic Salvation Front, the FIS, uh, won the first round of a national election and was poised to win the second round and take power in Algeria, which got a lot of people worried. Oh my goodness, is this going to be one man, one vote, one time? We've got a bunch of Islamists who are just about to take power in Algeria. What do we do about it? Well, what the Algerian military did about it was to cancel the election, basically take power themselves, which then was the, uh, the first step in a couple of years of horrible bloodshed in Algeria, which probably a couple of hundred thousand people lost their lives. People who were officials then still wring their hands over what the U.S. posture should have been. What it was at the time was, in effect, turning a blind eye to the military coup. And now we've faced, and the Obama administration has faced uh, similar quandaries in these last several weeks. I want to make a couple of main points about how this all relates to terrorism. One is, overall, what's happening uh, is wonderful news for us. If you consider the implications of what I said earlier about roots of terrorism. To the extent that more democracy breaks out in the Middle East, that's a very, very bad thing for Ayman al-Zawahiri. It's a very good thing for us who do not want more recruits for people like Zawahiri and more sympathy for the sort of extreme things that he and bin Laden and others like them do. So from that standpoint, we ought to cautiously, of course, but nonetheless uh, very optimistically look at it as a wonderful blow against what might be a lot of future international terrorism. My second main point is um, we have to be careful not to blow it as far as our own posture and policy is concerned. Uh, my own opinion in terms of how the Obama administration has handled things so far with particular reference to Egypt is pretty darn good. I can't uh, lay out some alternative course of action that I would recommend that would be appreciably different. But just take Egypt itself, which is the most important country we're talking about. There is still a lot of opportunity to blow it. Um, and the main thing one hears a lot about these days, especially from certain opinion quarters here in the United States, and my goodness, we're hearing it from Israel a lot, is fear of Islamists. 
with Islamists being all put together in one Islamic pot without differentiating between moderates, extremists, or anyone else. We hear a lot about the Muslim Brotherhood. Oh my goodness, this is the group that had Syed Qutb, and didn't he say a lot, whole lot of radical things before Nasser executed him back in the 1960s? And wasn't the Muslim Brotherhood, the group that a lot of people like Zawahiri once belonged to, and so on and so forth? The Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood has um, followed a nonviolent path now for a long time. And they are, in fact, antagonists of the likes of Zawari and bin Laden, precisely because they have followed a nonviolent path. We should recall that history from the 1990s that I, I gave you a little bit about before. When Zawahiri and the Gamad al Islamiya and the, and the extremists were using violence to try to undermine the Mubarak government, the Muslim Brotherhood wasn't doing anything of the sort, and despite being outlawed for years and years, they were still trying to work peacefully. And people like Zawahiri thought they were fools to do so, that the only thing that would work is violence. Well, when nothing worked and the Mubarak government was still firmly in power around the end of the 1990s, then what did the extremists do? They went off and took the transnational route, the bin Laden route, and started targeting the United States. Now has come the, the time of acid test for Egypt and for those who want to take a posture toward Egypt's political uh, constitution. If now, after all that's happened these last few weeks, and after all that the Muslim Brotherhood basically put up with by sticking to this peaceful path despite being outlawed by the Mubarak government and so on, if even after all that they are rejected as a legitimate political player, then I fear that we will see a repeat of what happened in the 1990s, only on a bigger scale. So what we would do to blow it is to reject the Brotherhood as a legitimate political actor. I hope that won't happen. And by the way, when it comes to counter-terrorist cooperation, um, I see absolutely no reason why a future uh, Egyptian government in which the Brotherhood played a major role would not continue to have extensive counter-terrorist cooperation with the United States for the reasons I mentioned before. They are antagonists to the violent jihadists, not partners of them. Let me uh, finally just make a kind of futuristic set of comments about uh, the status of jihadi terrorism overall. I made some distinctions earlier about Al-Qaeda Central is probably down, but the larger movement is, is still up. And all right, you may ask, uh, what about sort of an, a net judgment on the whole thing and where it's likely to go in the next several years? Well, where it's likely to go in the next several years is going to depend on a lot of those things we do, like what I was just talking about with regard to Egypt. So any um, crystal balling is fraught with, uh, with hazards here. But I'll just make a couple other points. You know, there are some people who have studied this phenomenon very closely, people like Gilles Keppel, the French scholar, who have made the argument, and I think a pretty persuasive argument, that there are reasons to say that this phenomenon of jihadi terrorism is already on the downhill slope. And I think we see some of the reasons for this in some of the, in some of the opinion polling and some of the attitudinal evidence of more and more people, more and more people in the Muslim world realizing the bankruptcy of the ideology that you know, however displeased they are with the political and economic systems they've had to deal with, bin Laden doesn't, in the end, really have an answer for making their life better. And number two, um, a lot of people are just contemplating the, uh, the, the, the horror of the violent methods and how many Muslims have been killed by those methods, not just Jews and Christians and Westerners. And I think that basic uh, line of argument is, is valid, but 
We've done some things, like the Iraq War, to flatten out the curve, even if that curve was already on the downhill slope. And what we most need to do in the years ahead, as far as counterterrorism is concerned, is just avoid the kind of mistakes that will make the curve go flat, let the jihadists make their own mistakes, and see the curve continue to go downhill. I'm going to stop there, and uh, I hope you got lots of challenges and questions. And again, uh, the floor is open for those other topics like South Asia and so on, if you want to get into it. But anybody? Yes, sir. How do you think the outcome of the war in Afghanistan and the whole situation with Pakistan there will affect international terrorism and the threat to the United States from that? The, uh, Oh, I wonder. Okay, you're right. There we go. Thank you. The extent of the international terrorist threat to American citizens will not depend on whether or not we win a counterinsurgency against the Afghan Taliban even though I, I fully realize that's our rationale for being there. The Afghan Taliban is not an international terrorist group. Uh, they are interested in the political and social order in Afghanistan. They don't really care about us, except insofar as we interfere with their ambitions for uh, shaping that political and social order in Afghanistan. As US officials, like General Jones, and Michael Leiter, the head of the National Counterterrorist Center, have told us there's hardly any al-Qaeda types in Afghanistan to begin with. Um, even if uh, the Taliban were to regain power over most of Afghanistan, like they had before we intervened in, in the Afghan Civil War in late 2001, this does not mean that they would welcome back Al-Qaeda. They know full well what happened the last time they played host to Al-Qaeda. Um, in short, they suffered the biggest setback they've ever suffered when we intervened and ousted them. It doesn't mean that uh, the Al-Qaeda leadership over on the other side of the Duran line would even want to come back. What, what the heck would be the advantage in, in, in doing so? Particularly given the fact that if they tried to establish anything close to the presence they had, prior to September of 2001, we would bomb the heck out of them. You know, the rules of engagement have changed entirely. The gloves are off, as my old colleague Kofor Black once put it. And there would be no hesitation whatsoever um, of the sort that we had back in the 1990s. And even if, contrary to all those uh, considerations, some kind of safe haven were again established in, in Afghanistan. S physical safe havens simply don't matter as much as they used to with regard to what sort of threat a group poses and what sort of capability a group has. Just look at the 9-11 operation itself. You know, we think of it as associated with Afghanistan, and in some ways it was, but where were most of the preparations? Where was most of the planning? Where was most of the training? Germany, Spain, flight schools in the United States. I mean, this is all part of what globalization is all about and how the bad guys, as well as the good guys, make use of modern information technology, the ability to move themselves, as well as money and information uh, across international boundaries. Um, so no, we've, we've, we intervened in Afghanistan in late 2001 for what I believe were very good and just reasons, and I supported that intervention. We were directly responding to 9-11. We were acting against the group that did 9-11 and the then regime, which controlled about 85% of Afghanistan, that was in close cahoots in, in the sense of having a partnership and fighting the Afghan Civil War with that group. Those conditions don't obtain anymore. And we've, we've, we've had basically what's amounted to a nine-year-long mission creep um, in which we've come to see the counterinsurgency as an end in itself. It's not an end in itself. Now, finally on this, with regard to Pakistan, uh, a lot of people take, take on board some of what I said. I said, yeah, but, but we're really there to keep Pakistan from falling apart, you know, with all those nuclear weapons and everything. I would strongly recommend something I was just reading on, on the plane coming up 
um, an article in the very newest issue, the, I guess it's the, the March-April issue of the National Interest by Anatole Lieben about Pakistan. Uh, I can't remember the exact title of his piece. But his basic argument is, and he, he's very well informed about Pakistan, this is extracted from a book that he just published, is if Pakistan is going to fall apart and somebody's going to get the wrong hands on those nuclear weapons, it's not going to be a bunch of Pashtuns from the Northwest. It's going to be because of the Punjabi core, which has like 56% of uh, the Pakistani population and 75% of the army personnel. Punjab has always dominated Pakistan. That there is going to be radicalism and fractionation within that Punjabi military establishment core. That's what Levin fears. Uh, I don't think we're on the verge of that, but if, if something really bad is going to happen in Pakistan, that will be it. And Levin makes the argument, with which I agree, that what we're doing in Afghanistan, if anything, increases the danger of that kind of thing happening. Because we're doing things that are enormously unpopular in Pakistan. The more pressure that we put on the Pakistani government to, well, fight those guys in the Northwest more, the greater the risk of the kind of radicalism and fractionation in, within the Pakistani security establishment that I'm talking about, the greater risk that, 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 that it will happen. So in that sense, what we're doing in Afghanistan is counterproductive. Does that answer your question? Let's... Um, Pakistan, what do you think about the American policy in Iran and its implications for the international community? Which aspect of U.S. policy? Uh, nuclear. I'm particularly referring to nuclear. Uh, I think uh, the we, the, and here's the collective we, which includes the United States and in recent years basically our Western partners too, uh, British, French, and Germans. Uh, we have um, straitjacketed ourselves by focusing so extremely narrowly on this one issue, the nuclear issue, and even more narrowly on uranium enrichment. As if these spinning centrifuge tubes embody everything of importance in the U.S.-Iranian relationship. They don't. Um, this, this is an issue that, um, that could have been dealt with if we had been more open-minded about exploring the various avenues of safeguards and, and so on. The Iranians claim, of course, that this is all peaceful nuclear program. Well, there are many non-dangerous ways of calling their bluff with regard to exploring safeguard avenues that we simply haven't explored. Because we've said, we don't want you to have an enrichment program. And in this latest dialogue of the deaf that we had in Istanbul, just, uh, what was it, three weeks ago, something like that? Um, the Iranians said, and, and we, we in the West perceived them as being kind of obstinate and inflexible, and, and, and I think they were. Uh, they insisted on the West declaring that Iran has a right to enrich uranium. Well, I think we could have finessed this a little bit by recognizing somehow that indeed, you know, under the terms of the Non-Proliferation Treaty and the International Non-Proliferation Regime, they do have a right to a peaceful nuclear energy program. Um, and yet, uh, all of the carrots that we've offered are all in return for stopping the enrichment program, not for exploring channels for seeing how Iranian objectives and Western objectives could both be satisfied. I don't think it's in the cards at all to have any kind of agreement between the West and Iran that does not provide for a uranium enrichment program. It's just not going to happen. The Iranians will never agree to it. Uh, regardless of what the views across the Iranian po political spectrum may be about the possibility of having a weapon, it is clear that having a nuclear program, ostensibly peaceful, has extremely broad and strong support. It's not just the hardliners. It's not just Ahmadinejad. So that's what I think of our policy. I think it's been... Uh, narrow and inflexible in a way that's hurt our own options. Oh, and by the way, I mean, one of the things that's hurt is, goes back to the last question, is we have 
through this policy and through this extremely narrow focus on uranium enrichment, have foregone opportunities to cooperate with the Iranians on a lot of other things, or for them to cooperate with us, that's what we're interested in, on a lot of things of high concern to us, like Afghanistan and Iraq. And we had you know, this one little brief window in recent history in which we did that after 9-11 after our intervention, Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. It was a window that lasted about two and a half months. When we cooperated, and they cooperated with us, the Iranians, in trying to remake the political order of Afghanistan. We had the Bonn Conference, and you can ask US diplomats like Jim Dobbins and Zal Khalilzad about how much they were able to work in cooperation with the Iranians. Uh, the Iranians hoped this would continue. We've got a lot of other parallel concerns, too, like the, the whole drug problem as it relates to Afghanistan. But then, uh, a couple of months later, um, George Bush declared the axis of evil, and the door was slammed in their face. And since then, we haven't benefited from any Iranian cooperation on anything of interest to us at all. Anybody over on this side of the room? Yeah. What, I mean, what we've seen in Egypt over the last or so, uh, what real diplomatic steps can we take at this point to help support or foster a uh, new democracy without providing fuel to uh, entities that you've mentioned already, the Al Qaeda Central, and in light of the fact that we might actually succeed in creating a democracy in Egypt, or succeed in helping democracy along Egypt, does it matter what they say regarding our, our involvement? It doesn't matter what the Egyptians say about it. Does it our matter what Al Qaeda Central oh. would come out and say? Okay. if we've succeeded in helping support our Okay. Well, the best thing we ought to do about what Al-Qaeda says or, uh, is try to ignore them. I mean, I, I, w I was smiling, you know, listening to the Zawahiri statement the other day. This is, talk, talk about you know, flailing away at trying to catch up with events and trying to exploit events. Um, I, 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 I love to see him just be as uncomfortable as he obviously was. And um, we, we want him to be irrelevant. We want bin Laden to be irrelevant. And that's one of the wonderful things that what's been happening is, if, if we don't screw this up, they will be more irrelevant. And I think part of the premise of your question, if I understand it, I, I would agree with. Uh, it, it's very hard to, for us to do a whole lot in the United States in terms of taking up stance without being counterproductive. And so the, the overall tone and just about everything we do and say ought to be, I know it sounds trite, but you know, this is up for the Egyptians to decide. And we look forward to working with whatever the, you know, the, the, new, um, the new management in Egypt turns out to be. And that basically ought to be our posture, even if it includes the Muslim Brotherhood. In the back. Um, you mentioned something about the Pakistani army's factionalization and possibility of the Punjabi court taking over. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, how, in the light of what you said, how do you, how do you manage the Kashmir problem, and what, if any, do you think the, the solution to the Kashmir problem lies? Okay. I think you know, the solution to the Kashmir problem has been pretty clear to most outside observers for quite some time. It's, it's you know, making the line of control an international boundary, albeit one with, that uh, uh, provides for a lot more trade and commerce and movement of people than, than, than we've had uh, so far. Uh, with the something that could be described as an extra bit of autonomy for uh, the Indian side of the border. I mean, not, not anything that members of the Indian Union would say uh, compromises the Union at all, but it would be so something that could be, quite frankly, a, more of a fig leaf uh, for, for those who have been on the other side of the question. But, but basically making the line of control uh, an international boundary. Um, and then you'd have to kind of negotiate the high end of it where the glacier is, but you know that's just ice, and that, that can be done. Um, I, I think it's we should all applaud the uh, announcement by the two sides uh, uh, just uh, a week or so ago to resume talks at the foreign secretary level, and we should all hold our breath that Lashkari Taiba or someone else is. Um, will be frustrated in trying to, uh, to screw this all up with another terrorist operation. Make no mistake, there's a lot of motivation, particularly by that group, to do exactly that. That's most what I fear. But uh, if the two sides can get some momentum going first, 
maybe this time we won't have a, like we had after Mumbai, what turned out to be about a two and a half year interruption. Uh, is there any state-sponsored terrorism <coughs> that you feel comfortable talking about uh, here where the state sponsor uh, is the United States and the country acted in is one of the Middle East North African countries? Do you have a particular activity or set of operations? Well, well I, I don't, but um, there are. I have heard people talk that the by story of some of the agitation and unrest now in the Middle East that there may be some involvement of, uh, of uh, Western countries uh, in terms of keeping that going. Well, I, um, and I, say that I from, from a naive point of view and not a political point of view. I subscribe to a very strict definition of terrorism, which uh, my preferred definition is very close to, although not identical with, the State Department's definition, which it uses for compiling statistics on terrorism. It is premeditated, politically motivated violence. This is the State Department definition. Premeditated, politically motivated violence um, carried out by clandestine agents of a state or a non-state actor, usually to influence a wider audience. Uh, the only ways in which I would modify that would be, number one, sometimes it could be the threat of violence and not just actually carrying it out. And number two, it doesn't have to be a group in the sense it could be an individual. You know, a lone actor like Miramal Kanzi, the guy who shot up the people outside the CIA, that never made it onto the State Department's terrorism statistics because it, technically he wasn't a group. That leaves a lot of other forms of political violence, including state-perpetrated political violence, that you or I or anyone else might object to, uh, might even condemn, but doesn't necessarily meet the definition of terrorism. Um, I, I find it just uh, a semantic disservice to apply the label terrorism as a kind of all-purpose pejorative on things that we might not like. There are a lot of things I don't like that come under the political violence label that I would not define as terrorism. And I suspect some of the things that you might have in mind would fit into that category. Um, so I think one of the key points you keep bringing up about kind of not screwing up the situation is Egypt. I mean, Egypt is, is for the US to kind of openly recognize all the, all the political players that are there. Um, well, we don't have to explicitly recognize. We just have to have a laissez-faire approach. Not, not, not reject any of them. Not reject, exactly. How um, do you think there will be kind of political pressure from the Israeli side to push the US to not recognize we're, some of those? We're, al we're already seeing it. We're already seeing and hearing it, and, and with particular regard to the Brotherhood. I mean, uh, we, we, we had a whole bunch of statements. And we see somewhat the same line from, I'll be quite blunt, you know, for, from elements of the, of the editorial right here in the United States that, that tend to sympathize with the Israeli right's point of view. Um, the Israelis have really been shaken up these last few weeks uh, by, by these events for a number of reasons. Um, you know, with Egypt, a lot's been said about, oh, the peace treaty can be in danger. It's not in any danger. I mean, it, it, every, every uh, Egyptian leader or would-be leader with a couple of brain cells realizes that if there were a new Israeli-Egyptian war, the Egyptian side would get absolutely clobbered by the Israeli Defense Forces, which would be far more capable and superior. Um, and the people in the Muslim Brotherhood are smart enough to realize that, just like everyone else. There are other reasons why um, the current Israeli government is real nervous about Arab democracy in general. Uh, it, it highlights, as long as you're talking about political rights and popular sovereignty, it highlights that one other area where there is a lack of popular sovereignty, and that's the uh, occupied Palestinian territories. It also undercuts part of the um, Israeli explanation, which to a large extent is a valid explanation of um, why there has been so, uh, so much inflexibility in the past on the Arab side on some of these issues. And, and that explanation is you got Arab leaders who are autocrats uh, and whose economies have performed poorly 
uh, who uh, like to use the continued Arab-Israeli conflict as a diversion and as an excuse for not reforming. And you know, there's a lot to that explanation. But you know, if you had fewer autocrats and you had Arab Democrats, that explanation wouldn't hold anymore. It would clearly be, especially in an Egypt, where the tone of the Egyptian-Israeli relationship, to the extent that each Egypt becomes more democratic, the tone, even though you're not going to have a new war, is almost certainly going to be worse than it was under the Mubarak government. I mean, my goodness, under Mubarak, you know, he was even cooperating with the, the strangling the Gaza Strip, stuff like that. And the, and the final reason, none of this gets articulated, but the final reason, I think, is has to do with the relationship with the United States. And what keeps coming back again and again about why the United States and Israel should have this extraordinary relationship with the $3 billion of aid and the vetoes of the UN and all that, because Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. What happens if Israel is not the only democracy in the Middle East? Tom Friedman had a pretty good comment about this just a few days ago. Uh, and the way he put it, he said, let me see, the Israelis are, keep saying, stick with us because we're a democracy. Oh, and one of the things you need to do is keep Egypt from becoming a democracy. Wait a minute, this doesn't compute. Um, I think those are all considerations. In addition to genuine just fear of, the un of, of uncertainty, of, of, of what, what, what might happen, and, and kind of an overall sense of encirclement, which is very understandable. Um, if I may follow up, too, how do you think the administration is going to handle that? Though? I would take what happened last Friday at the UN as an indication. Um, virtually alone in the world community, and on a question, the settlements. Anybody read the resolution that, that was on the table that was 14 to 1 and the U.S. cast the veto? There's not a word in there except maybe calling it illegal as opposed to illegitimate, which is the U.S. preferred uh, terminology on the settlements. It doesn't just express things that the United States repeatedly has said is their own policy. Not only stopping the settlements, but calling for resumption negotiations, use the quartet roadmap. I, Susan Rice's uh, explanation of vote is extraordinary to read, too, because about 95% of it basically says, we're strong in favor of everything that's in the resolution. We all know the politics that's behind it. And uh, I, I think uh, that's last Friday kind of answers your question. I believe. And, and that, that is why I, I have fears of um, how this may influence the posture toward the Egyptian events in, in the weeks ahead. I hope I'm, I hope I'm wrong. Not from a terrorism perspective, but in general, what are your observations and thoughts about Bahrain, uh, which is, you know, interesting for a few reasons. The you only know, like yeah. GCC country that really is uh, has some uprising and that has the, you know, undercurrent of the Sunni versus Shia, and yet you know, we have a, a large military base. Well, I think you, 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 you've just mentioned the two things that need, we need to remember. Um, one, there is the sectarian dimension that, that goes beyond what we've seen in the other countries. Uh, it, it is the one Gulf country that's got a uh, Shia majority you know, under a Sunni uh, ruling family. And uh, the Fifth Fleet and the, and the military presence makes that a, an especially tough one for us. You know, Qatar would also be a tough one for the same reason, but fortunately so far, you know, that's... Even that, more that's with the natural gas. Well, well, well yeah, right. Um, I think for, for, for that latter reason, um, there's probably a, as, at least as much hand-wringing going on about Bahrain right now as there has been about any of the other countries over the last month. And I, I, don't, have, I don't have an alternative solution. <laughs> it's, it's a toughie. One of the things that strikes me about the events in Egypt and Tunisia, maybe Libya, Bahrain, is um, the extent to which I wasn't at least uh, aware that these things were possible. And, and so, you know, you, you had a career in the intelligence community and uh, had access to a lot of information. Do, do we have good visibility into the populations of these areas and sort of do we have 
means by which we can understand what's a tipping point and what isn't? The tipping points we're talking about basically timing. No, I think you're in the realm of the unpredictable. Social scientists have a hard time postdicting things like that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Even in this country. Yeah. Um, if you're talking more strategically about uh, you know the undercurrents that have make for the potential for this to happen, so oh yeah, yeah the understanding is pretty darn good. And I think I was interested to see a uh, report uh, in the New York Times just about three or four days ago by Bark Landler that uh, revealed that uh, B uh, President Obama had ordered up a secret interagency um, task force uh, study on the whole question of possibility for unrest in, in the Middle East. This was last August. <laughs> and I wrote about that in my blog, pointing out, wait a minute, what, what happened to all this talk about the administration being caught off guard and caught by surprise? And <laughs> apparently the president wasn't caught enough by surprise not to order up his, uh, the State Department, the CIA, and the NSC staff to, to last August to look at this very stuff. And, and uh, according to Landler's report, the secret report, which is still classified, um, but evidently somebody decided they just couldn't resist leaking some of it because it was, it was so at, at odds with so much of this commentary we've been hearing. Um, it, it isolated four, it, it focused on four countries which were not named, but uh, given the description, they seem to have been Egypt, Yemen, Bahrain, and Jordan. And this was all uh, a lot of intense uh, planning activity starting last summer. I thought that was pretty instructive. But the particular tipping point, the timing, no. I'm never going to get that. Anybody else? Yes. Um, you pointed out that the NPRF were uh, a lot to do with the insurgents or, or recruits for the jihadist movement. I hope I'm remembering this correctly, but I think a week or two ago, one of President Bush's uh, advisors wrote something into the Washington Post to the effect of Bush was right, and going into Iraq actually did help uh, the potential for democracies to flourish in the Middle East, and we're seeing that now with uh, what's going on. What, do you give that argument any credence at all? Yeah. Right, right, right about what? Right that, um, that there was discontent with the existing political and economic order? Everyone agreed on that. You know, you know, people on the very much non-neoconservative side agreed with that. Uh, the differences came in terms of what you do about it, and what method you use to try to try to shake things up. Um, hence the Iraq War. Uh, I think, and what we've seen happening is uh, events that were not made in the United States, and precisely because they weren't, they've been more successful, and the people doing them have less to apologize for. And this has been noted again and again by uh, like people like like uh, Tom Friedman and Nick Kristoff, who have you know, soaked in the events of Tahrir Square and have, and this is delighted, I'm delighted to read this, anti-Americanism has not been much of a theme. But also, the pro-democracy thrust has not been a made in America thing. This is you know, Egyptians saying, we're doing it. We're the ones who are doing this. And we're proud of that. And likewise with the Bahrainis right now. That makes a huge difference because the, the Made in USA label, even if you don't try to do it with firepower and inject democracy through the barrel of a gun, which is what we try to do in Iraq, but instead try to do it with some kind of active freedom agenda, the Made in USA label is one of the biggest handicaps that any initiative or proposal in the Middle East can possibly have. Um, so no, I, I, don't, I don't see that it demonstrates anything that was right. Uh, if anything, it's to the contrary. Sir, uh, Libya and Tunisia don't seem to have strong uh, Islam Islamist movements in them, but do you think in a nation like Egypt or Yemen or Bahrain, we could see sort of an Iranian revolution-like situation take place where a small group of Islamists kind of hijack the you know, current demand for democracy? Very unlikely. Um, a lot of major differences I don't have time to go into, but you know, the whole Shia structure under Khomeini, the exile movement, um, I mean, there's nothing like that uh, with, with those Arab countries that you mentioned. Uh, so 
mainly for that reason, which, which gets partly to the, the Shia-Sunni difference in terms of a clerical hierarchy in the one and, and not in the other. Um, no, I don't think that's a danger. I assume you think that the made of USA label in Japan and Germany and Taiwan and North, North Korea, South Korea, is more acceptable. Uh, I, I, I assume that you feel that way. But what do you think the difference is between made in USA in those countries and, and, and the attempt in, let's say, Iraq? Well, the differences weren't what's, what was said on the label. The differences had much more to do with the background of, of events and history in those countries. Um, which included uh, prior experience with representative government of the sort that we haven't uh, seen to the same degree in some of the countries we're talking about. And in the case of post-World War II, Japan and Germany, of course, we're talking about two countries that have been absolutely flattened and crushed, badly defeated in a horribly costly world war. That, that's a huge difference. So a mistake may have been not to hardly crush Iraq before we got to the I mean, in that context. Um, let me uh, be a little more precise. They were crushed in a world war that they started, that the Germans, the Nazi Germans, and the Japanese imperialists started. We started the Iraq War. That's a big difference, too. We have time for one or two more questions if anybody's got any. I'll just make an observation um, because you've been very meticulous in some of your definitions, but when we talk about anti-Americanism, um, from my days in the Peace Corps back in the 60s, one of the things that surprised me immensely was the difference between people liking Americans and not liking our foreign policy. And then I've seen that around the world, and it's, you know, it's a very interesting distinction that we're not always ready for. I mean, it happened specifically in the Dominican Republic when Johnson sent in the Marines and the Dominican people surrounded Peace Corps volunteers to protect them and they refused to be evacuated. Uh, I found the same thing in Chile when I was there during Project Camelot. And, uh, this That's a very important and useful distinction. Yes, I was probably being a little too sloppy in referring to anti-Americanism where for the most part I'm talking about um, opposition to U.S. policy. Um, and and there are various ways we could explore this issue where e even some of the extremists, you know, uh, uh, find some, uh, some aspects of U.S. culture they actually like. <laughs> but um, uh, but that's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no, I'm, that, that's right. No, no it's, thank you for bringing that point out because it's an important distinction to make in, in any of these discussions. Any one last question? Okay. Well, Blunt, you got us right to 5.58, so okay. I learned a lot. I'm sure all you guys did, too. So let's uh, thank our guests very much for coming up to Cold Hanover today. Thank you very much.